Good morning, Facebook friends, and welcome everybody as we finish up. It's always uh, like, it's always amazing to me that we're at the end, when we get to the end. <laughs> but I have loved this so much, and I know from some of you, you guys have really liked it a lot too. And I've learned so much, and it's always crazy to me because uh, how much there is to learn about something that we think we already know these stories. And so, yeah, it's been a, it's been a pleasure uh, to do this with you, and I'm looking forward to getting into these last couple of chapters, 10 and 11. And I will just kind of warn everyone, so my oldest son has turned 16 during this quarantine, and the DMV opened today. And so my husband is going in late to work, and they have gone to the DMV to stand in line, and he, he's sent me some pictures, and the line was significant. So at some point, my son may interrupt us, uh, proclaiming that he's now a licensed driver. So uh, And if he does, I'll just need a mom moment. But to, <laughs> to, to take care of that. So, <laughs> so, well, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll dive into lesson seven. Holy Father, thank you so much for just again the, um, the opportunity that each of us have to study. And I thank you for this group of people who um, make up part of their time committed to you, Lord, to study and to grow. And then to come to class, Lord, and to share what you've been doing in their hearts as we have studied. And so I just lift up this study, um, this particular study as we close it down today, Lord. And I thank you for all that we have learned and what we'll learn today. And, um, and what you will continue to do in my heart through what I've learned over the past few weeks, Lord. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to study with these ladies. And um, Lord, I'm just so grateful that when we come to you wanting to learn more about you, Lord, you are always willing uh, to meet us and to share your heart with us. And so we thank you for that. And we ask that you open our hearts today, Lord, to what you'd have us here. And we lift all this in Jesus name. Amen. It's crazy to me sometimes how, um, how long I think about these studies. I was a guest at a church Sunday before last and the pastor was asking me some questions about my journey and sanctification and how God uh, grows us. And um, I talked about Moses, for those of you who've been uh, studying with me that long, when um, we did the book of Exodus, some of us did. And I just talked about one of the things that I still am so struck by from studying Exodus, and that's probably been maybe three years ago, anybody? I, if you did, I don't know, it's probably been close to three years. Um, yeah, and um, I'm like, one of the things that still sticks with me so much about that study is Moses' progression, how like at, at the burning bush in chapter three, he has all these questions and objections and all that. You remember that where he's like, who am I and who are you? And what uh -huh. if they don't listen to me and all that? And then by the time you get to chapter 33 with all the stuff that he's done with God and everything, and his only question when God is kind of like, now it's going to be time to go into the promised land. His only question or statement really is, if you're not going, I don't want to go. Like, are you going with us? That's all I, you know, and it's just like this progression of how his relationship with God and his understanding of the importance of his dependence on God has changed. And, um, and that's been so long ago. And yet that's still just something that's really like personal to me in my own, you know, walk with God. And so I just, I always look forward, sometimes when I end a study like this, um, good morning, Lisa, and good morning, Mary Ellen. Um, uh, when I end a study like this, I don't even know sometimes what those nuggets are going to be that really just stand out to me in terms of what God has taught me over the last few weeks. So anyway, um, um, let's go, let's look at our at a glance and just finish up any information that we might need to on the at a glance. I wanted to look at, make sure we had chapter themes and also segment divisions. If you guys want that, at a, it's on 141. And I'm just going to go ahead. Let's talk about, cause we're going to cover 10 and 11 today. So let's talk about chapter themes for that. And then also I'll go back through those segment divisions that I talked about last week and we'll add the last one too. So. How about a chapter theme for 10? Anybody have something there that... It's Barb's favorite, the generations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Barb was saying how generations maybe are not her thing. <laughs> have you seen my huge genealogy of Jesus poster, Barb? That we did. It, it was hanging in the back of the room at the Murfreesboro Church when we were meeting there, and I've brought it home now. It's on my side. Um, it's huge and it's on my wall. I can't get it down right now, but it is human. I love it though, because it, I, I've, been, I've looked at it several times because, you know, it starts with Adam and it like, and it goes through like Shem and yeah, and it's just, it's interesting. And it's so far, it's all right compared to what we're studying. So that's good. So, um, but for chapter 10, I just put generations of Noah's sons 
is all that I put there. Anybody have something fancier than that? Generations of Noah's sons. I, I came at it from a different angle. Go ahead. It's, it's the same, but I, in a way, but I, I just put repopulation of the earth. Yeah, repopulation of the earth works fine too. Yeah, absolutely. Even though, and we'll get to this, even though it, it was a bit laborious just going through the generations, isn't it fascinating, though, like, to, to see yeah. how the nations divide and split? Yeah. And then, um, generation, chapter 11 is the city of Babel slash descendants of Shem, is what I put. And I put a little arrow in my description from Shem to Abram, because I think that's significant, um, Chapter 12, which is the one after where this study ends, is when the covenant is the, is the first mention of the covenant between God and Abram. So we're right at the, you know, as we finish up chapter 11, if we moved on in Genesis, we would go into the whole story of Abram, who's later Abraham, right? And all Abram and Sarah and where the, where the, what we call the Jewish people, you know, begin. Yeah. So, so for, Jesus, yeah, go the city of Abel and what was the other part? Descendants of Shem. Okay. And then from Shem, I put this little arrow that says Abram, just for, you know, for me, because that's where, that's where we're going next if we continued studying Genesis. And what was the rest of it? Just the city of Babel slash okay, thank you. descendants yeah. of Shem. Tower of Babel. Tower, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, that's good to you. So then for the segment divisions, and we did some of this last week, but I'll just review. Uh, one and two, I put a line after two and put that, I labeled that as creation. Three, four, five, I labeled as sin and death. Six to nine, I put flood slash judgment on sin. And 10 and 11, I put nations divide. This is when I miss my overhead projector, so you guys can see it. <laughs> There's actually a whiteboard on this. I should play with that in... Um, I don't know if it lets me... What does it do? Can I type? Oh, look at that. You guys can't see. Hey, good morning, Kathy. I'm just going to play with this, like, chapter one. You guys see what I'm doing? Yep, yeah. Oh, okay. Like, this isn't fancy at all because um, I've never done this before, so I'll just try, just, and then maybe I can get better at it and if we need it for something. And for those of you watching on Facebook, I'm just playing with a... a a shareable screen in my Zoom so the ladies that are on here can see what I'm saying. Can this screen only be used in real time or can you have it? Um, you know what I've done before? That's a good question. I've, I can do a, um, like a Microsoft Word document and then share it. That's what I've done with some like handouts and stuff. Um, so I could do that. Yeah. So sometimes, and I miss this, and for those of you on Facebook, um, and then I'm sure I can make this bigger and all that kind of stuff. I was just playing with it. For those of you on Facebook, that's one thing that I missed because when we were when we were in class, I can use the overhead projector and then you guys can see it and they can see it and all that. So I'm still figuring out how best to do this so everybody can see. But I'll just go through the segment divisions real quick one more time. Chapter 1 and 2, creation. Chapter 3 to 5, sin and death. Chapter 6 to 9 is the flood slash judgment on sin. And then chapters 10 and 11 is the nation's divide. So, so, so there we go. There's something else I can play with. Um, okay. So, so chapter 10, as we get into this, you know, there's like this repeated theme in Genesis where one chapter kind of does the basics and then the, the other chapter does some details, right? And so we see that pattern again in 10 and 11 where chapter 10 is kind of an overview of what's happening and then chapter 11 pulls out one 
significant part of what's happening and gives us more details on it yeah. yeah and so and that's just kind of the literary style of this book at least in these 11 chapters that we've been studying um so let's jump into 10 and um right off the bat we talk it talks about how it's, verse one these are the records the generations of shem ham and japheth and we learned last week that that's not the order of birth, right? We talked about that because Ham, from the from the situation where Noah was naked in his tent, he talks about his youngest son. Do I remember that right? So so it's not. I, I don't know why. I just kind of always assumed they were listed in order, but apparently not, right? So um, yeah. So is do we know is Shem the oldest though? Do we know that? I can't. I don't remember knowing. Yeah. That. It, okay, we do know that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it says it in somewhere the. Okay. It said it, he was the oldest. Okay. Then, uh, All right, so we have that. And then the first group that we're going to talk about is um, Japheth's sons or descendants, right? And there's a we did, we did a little chart on page 93. At least I wrote that down, right? Oh, though the, the map is on 93, of what, like which directions they're going. If you want to look at that while we're 93 is the, is the map like this with the arrows, the different places that they're going. I did find it easier if I color coded those. those yeah, cities. I did a little bit of coloring on that map too, just yeah, to kind of give too. me an idea. Yeah. Um, and so, so here we are with Japheth, and verse five talks about them going towards the coastland. So you can see there, if you're looking at that map on ninety three, they're the they're the arrow at the top, like towards Europe, which would be west and north. And these kind of things are not my best, this, this is not my strong suit, as you all know, which is, uh, we, the, everything can't be someone's strong suit, right? I did find some commentary about these places, I guess. I'm just going to, this is stuff that I just found um, that was in some of the notes that I was reading. Um, so Ashkenaz, and I don't have, I actually don't even know right now if that was a place. Oh, yeah. It, Ashkenaz is just to the right of the Black Sea on the top of 93. And I don't even know if I'm saying that right. But um, it says that some people relate Ashkenaz with the Scythians, a group of people that camp comes up later in history. Um, the footnote for Dodanim in first, it says Rodanim or Dodanim, Rodanim. That is... Um, that's down. The one, the Rodanim on the 93 is R H O D. It's right above the Mediterranean Sea. Oh, right in the middle. Yeah. Something that that was a reference to the island of Rhodes. And I, I'm not educated enough on this kind of thing that I even know what the island of Rhodes is. I'm just telling you some things that maybe some of you guys do. Uh, Tarshish. Now, that might be something that's familiar to us. Why? Tarshish Wait. is over on the left, Paul. right um, by Italy. That yes. Was Paul. Yes, I think you're right about that. I was thinking Jonah, because Jonah, doesn't Jonah flee to Tarshish? Uh, well, I don't know about that, but I remember Paul went to Tarshish. Uh-huh, I think you're right, and I was thinking Jonah. Um, he might, yeah. When, might when God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, I think that's in Jonah um, 1. We can look that up real quick. Um, he takes, instead he takes a boat to Tarshish, right? Um, yeah, Jonah 1, 3. Um, Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I think you are right about that. I think it's mentioned in, in the New Testament with that. And then several of these, it says Gomer, Magog, Tubal, several of those are mentioned in Ezekiel in relationship to war and God's judgment in the end times. So I don't know about y'all, but when I read through these... <clears throat> Except for Tarshish, that um, stuck out to me. Oh, good. Lisa says Rhodes is a Greek island. Good to know. Lisa, your Greek knowledge has been very helpful the last couple of days. Lisa and I were doing a, a Bible study last night with a group and a, a Greek word that came up. She's like, I know what that is. It's the marketplace. In, uh, it's what they call the marketplace, like the farmer's market sort of thing in uh, Greece. And I'm like, well, there you go. And now she knows it's a Greek island. So thank you. <laughs> You're a world traveler and we appreciate it. Um, yeah. So, so that's kind of the, that's Japheth's sons. And then starting in verse six on chapter 11, we get, I mean, chapter 10, sorry, we get to Ham's sons, right? And they go west and south, if you're still looking. So they're, that's at the bottom of 93, kind of with the arrow that's going down to the Sahara Desert. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And one of Ham's sons was Cush, who becomes the father of Nimrod. And Nimrod is kind of like a central character in chapter 10, and then in chapter 11 also. And it says in verse 9 that Nimrod is a mighty hunter before the Lord. And this is interesting because when you read close, like in verse 10, uh, the beginning of his kingdom is uh, Babel, Babel or Babylon. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that. Um, oh, the, <laughs> she went to a wedding last summer on Rhodes. Okay, well, now you might just be bragging about where you go. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Uh, Donald, hey! <laughs> Be careful when you come, when the husbands come in the uh, Zoom box, then I'm like, yeah. Um, so Babylon, and then, then he builds, and still in 10, verse 10, he builds Nineveh, Rehoboth, Kalah, Resin, pardon me for not knowing how to say these things, and then all of that is in Assyria. So we have this beginning, right? This Nimrod is building nice. this these communities, these cities, which are both are in Babylon and Assyria. And what do we know that is coming about Babylon and Assyria? And they're going to fight. Right, yes, because Assyria is going to take over the northern kingdom, right? I mean, years later. And Babylon yeah. will take captive the southern kingdom. Yeah. I just thought that was just popped up. I'm like, hey, we know what those are. Thank you. It would be really interesting to listen to uh, a historian or a Bible professor. I wouldn't want to get real bogged down in taking it all the way from this time, from that time to current day. But, mm -hmm. you know, after it just kind of hit me that, you know, this is really the kind of the core of what what's to come. Right. You know? Sort of the setting the stage for right. so much that we learn. In the exactly. Bible. Yeah. We yeah. It's to. it's interesting when those pieces kind of come together this way, where you're like, oh, this is the beginning of that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the beginning. So we're actually going to do something a little bit different than we usually do, and because we're going to go chronologically today, a little bit different. So I'm actually going to pause on chapter ten, and we're going to go into eleven for just a little bit, because what eleven does is it unpacks more about what this verse 10 is telling us from Nimrod. Does that make sense? So we're going to kind of look at the details of kind of this verse 10 or right around here with Nimrod's like building. And we're going to see more details about that. So in so 11, verse, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, this is what's so easily missed when we, uh, when we don't study like both slower and with some like for me commentary help and stuff because I miss these things because I don't understand the history the same way but this is chronologically chapter 11 1 to 9 is chronologically what's happening right in this part where we are in chapter 10 so we're going to go into chapter 11 for just a little bit and 11 1 says what about the whole earth at this point Using the same language. Same language. Right, yeah. The whole earth used the same language. And in verse 2, they journeyed east, or in the ESV it says they migrated from the east. And these are some of the families of Noah's son. Um, oh, Lisa Wood is suggesting, Laura, that you put that study together for us, actually. She's heckling, oh, yeah. <laughs> She's heckling you through Facebook. She recognizes your voice, and she has a challenge for you. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> That's good. She likes it. I think she's on that, Lisa. Um, so Noah's family then is migrating uh, from the east. And they were, uh, these are the families of Noah's sons, of course. And they fi find a plain, which a, a plain like just is a level piece of land, right? I have, you know, in um, Shinar and settle there. And this is where the beginning of Nimrod's kingdoms are. On the um, map, there's under the Black Sea, where it says Turkey, because that's like modern day Turkey. That's where the Ark would have landed on Mount Mount Ararat. Ararat um, is where the Ark landed after the flood, and now that's modern day Turkey. So that gives you a, that I, that gave me a little like an idea of this is where they were starting. 
after the flood. Um, Joyce, are you talking to us and we can't hear you? Oh, okay, good. I, I'm actually talking to Aaron. Oh. Okay, good, because I'm like, wait a second, I looked up and I saw your mouth moving, but I'm like, no sound is coming through my speakers. It's not in my nightgown, oh. and so we were trying to get on Facebook Live gotcha. so she could see, so she can see but we oh, can't see. No, you don't have to apologize. I was just like, wait a second, she's trying to talk, and I can't hear her. Um <laughs> Aaron, there's only like five of us that could see you anyway, though. So if you want to be on and you're not, oh no. <laughs> um, yes. So uh, I forgot to say. Oh, the, so the ark would have landed uh, on Mount Ararat, which is modern day Turkey. And you guys can kind of see that under the Black Sea. Anyway, I kind of liked knowing that because that gave me a jumping off point for where these people were like starting when they were going different places. Anyway, so then 11.3, they're using bricks for stone and, what does it say, and tar for mortar to build a city and a tower that it says in verse 4, what? What, what did they want to build a tower that will what? It's the heavens. It's the heavens. Right. Now, I don't know about you all. I studied this. Uh, on my own maybe a year or so ago because I've been in the church that I'm serving we've been working through the book of Genesis and um, we've been in Jacob's life for a long time now because there's a lot to talk about with Jacob but uh, as we were kind of moving through these stories and I got to 11 I had I don't I had never really studied the Tower of Babel and I what I realized was everything that I had been taught about it or thought I knew about it was wrong because I don't know about you all but when I was young I was taught that they were building a tower like because they wanted to praise God and get close to heaven like it was like a positive motivation that they were building this tower but then upon closer inspection it might say and I didn't compare it in other in other verses it says and a tower whose top will reach into heaven but it doesn't say anything about that being a positive motivation to do so like trying to get close to God as a matter of fact right after that it says quite the opposite right oh, let us yeah. make a name for ourselves name for ourselves right organized rebellion <laughs> organized rebellion right and I thought how interesting that I know and I can't point to like a, a specific lesson but I'm going back to like the flannel board and I'm not being sarcastic like you know like when I in Sunday school and stuff about how these people were trying to reach heaven to be close to God I'm like no that's not right at all um, well, and it, it also says, otherwise we will be scattered. Uh -huh. So evidently they did not they want to separate. They didn't want to separate, uh, which is exactly they didn't want to separate. what, God did. what they <laughs> told them. And, and God, you know, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and multiply. right? Yeah. Which indicates, mm -hmm. it indicates a, a movement on, right? Like there is, there is a part of scattering in that. The um, other thing is yeah. they built on a plain, which is about sea level. Babylon's really about sea level. And I mean, they didn't build it on the mountains surrounding like Mount Ararat. I mean, you would think if they really, really wanted to be closer to heaven, they would have started out on a higher point. They were building it on a plane. So it does indicate that this was not so they could be closer to heaven. Yeah, it was, it was so much more about um, doing their own thing and creating yeah, something. Exactly. Yeah. I think we have to think about that. That's just popping into my mind right now. We have to be thinking about that with what we're building also, right? Am I building something um, in response? You know, because we're all building a life or, you know, building something, building relationships. And are we doing those in a true motivation to be close to God, to be a reflection of God? Or are we doing those to make a name for ourselves? I, you know, I don't know about y'all, but like in the world that I've been immersed in in the last couple of years since I started Steady On, I, um, I'm i around a lot of Christian communicators, right? Um, they're writers and speakers and podcasters and all this. And one of the things that for me that's been really challenging is that, and there are a lot of good, and most mostly ladies, not all ladies, but there are a lot of really wonderful ladies that are honestly just being obedient with gifts they've been given to try to share Jesus with the world through that gift. And then there are other places that it doesn't feel like that to me at all, right? That it really is more about building a name for yourselves and for yourself and um, 
And I, that's something that I have to kind of keep in check and keep in balance all the time because just like anything else, there are people that seem like they're getting ahead, right? And, um, but I, you know, I feel like the Lord's kind of just reminded me that's, there's, that's not, that's not the goal here. Uh, Joanna Weaver, I like her so much. I might have said this to you guys before because she said something. She's, she's a mentor in the Flourish Writers Group that I'm a part of that I talk about sometime. And she wrote a book some years ago. I, it was a huge bestseller called Having a Merry Heart in a Martha World. I don't know if you've heard of that book before. And, um, she, and she speaks to us sometimes. And one of the things that she said a couple years ago that really kind of wrecked my heart in a good way, she was like, it's his job, it's our job, to deepen the message and it's his job to broaden the ministry and when I feel like I'm a little bit out of step with like either what I'm building and I this is about me but it's about all of us right when I feel like I'm a little out of step with what I'm building or what my motivation is for what I'm building I try to go back to that advice and say my root my my job and I would argue suggest that all of our jobs like our main job is deepening the message clinging to the Lord and just like with the fruit of the spirit that we were talking about from Galatians or in John 15 where he talks about abide in me when we are connecting ourselves and keeping ourselves connected with the Lord then what will flow out of that will be an, sort of like an automatic response to that which he is teaching us and not something that we are building we're not gonna have to gather the bricks and the mortar right um, we have to do our part but we don't have to like gather with this idea of making a name for ourselves I don't know if anybody can pick that up or not but um, Angie? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Mary Ellen first, then Barb. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I have in, um, I was just looking in the Quest Bible, and on the side, it's, it's they have a thing, why build a tower? Yes. And it said two reasons were given, to make a name for themselves, that is to accomplish something of, of lasting significance, and two, to keep from being scattered over the earth. So in a way, it doesn't sound all that bad. They just want it. But then, but then I looked in the um, in another Bible here, and it said that they were um, just going against what God wanted. Yeah, and I think and that's the tricky so, part of this, right? Because when you first read it, it doesn't seem all that bad. Or when you first yeah. look at somebody's life that's building something that for good, maybe it doesn't seem all that bad. But the question always is, how does this line up with what God? has commanded yeah. slash ask me personally to do, right? How does this fit they with, they, go ahead. Yeah, they wanted some, they, they said perhaps after uh, fear is left by the flood, caused a desire for some to, uh, to have some form of security. Yes, and how, so, what do we do in order to have security, right? Um, we do a lot because we want to keep this like false illusion of control. And if we yeah. do this, you know, God is sending us out there where we, here, how about this? God is sending us out there where we don't know what's going to happen. But if we yeah. stick together yeah. in this way, then we can have some kind of control over what happens next. Yeah. yeah. It's just Barb, interesting yeah, go ahead. to the Bible said. They, I mean, they were kind of not against each other, but, almost, but uh, just um, saying it in different ways. And, and not but either way they were going against God ultimately yeah. not trusting that what God had told them to do was what was best I to do, do right ultimately not trusting that what God had told them to do what was what was best to do go ahead Barb what else did you I haven't forgotten you I read something very interesting too the mortar they used the tar uh -huh. was the same waterproof material they believed because that's what was available to them that was on the outside of, of the, the ark. ark oh interesting and they were they were making this tower waterproof because and they oh. you know this also shows that what i was reading in his commentary it also shows that they were questioning whether he was going to make the flood come again even though his promise was i will never destroy the world with water again they were they were not only disobeying his command to fill the earth, but they were building a shelter that they thought perhaps could keep them from a flood. And so, I, so yeah, so I go back to that question for us then. It, very interesting. Yeah, I, I had not heard that, but it makes sense. It makes sense. So where are we constructing our safe place exactly. instead of trusting mm -hmm. in the provision that God provides, yeah. right? Or the provision that God offers. Where do we build our safe place and try to make our ark to protect us from things when 
he's already offered protection from whatever comes along, right? Go ahead, Joyce Heller. Yeah, you had something. Yeah. Uh, well, I but, had read yeah. about the effects of the flood on the earth. Yeah. And I, I had this big, long thing. It's really interesting. But basically, bottom line is it said it is likely that large earthquakes and volcanic eruptions occurred on a daily basis after the flood. So they felt safe in that plane and didn't want to do what he said uh -huh. and move on to different places. Uh -huh. Again, fear and not following his word, just kind of like when he told them to go up to that hill country and they said there were giants, so yep. they didn't go, you know. So, how, so it's heavy. scary out there. And so Scary I will stay in my safe place and not go forward in the place that God calls me uh -huh. to. Yeah, we can pick that up yeah. too, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, go ahead, Joyce. Yeah. I'm pausing because I read something like that this week. I did too. But the, reason, the reason I asked that is. <laughs> I just wondered how much time it took for him to become disobedient again. About four seconds, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Let's look at that. I know. Joy, in case you guys can hear, Joyce is like, I'm just kind of curious how long it took for them to become disobedient again. And that's what I was saying. So look, let's look at this on page 149 just to see. I don't know if we can find an answer to that. But there's this in our, the overlapping of the patriarchs' lives. Right, and so the flood is here like at 1600, and then Abraham goes to Canaan at like 2100. How long between the flood and the Tower of Babel? I mean, if you guys will indulge me, I'll, I'll ask that question in the computer. I'm looking at the thing that says Noah's descendants, yes, and it shows Ham. Is the father of Cush, and then Nimrod is way. So we're talking maybe a couple, maybe a generation uh -huh. or two. Yeah. Actually, if you look at Noah's descendants on page ninety-two, yes, yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Okay. So, well, wouldn't oh, it I be see. more? Wouldn't it be more generations than a couple? Here's one well, thing I I found. Is, um, Cush to Nimrod. Nimrod was one of Cush's kids. So would it oh, be Ham? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm, okay. I'm inter I interpreted that. Ham, uh -huh. Yeah. So this says that the flood occurred when Noah was 600 years old, and the Tower of Babel, Noah was 940 years old. Okay. Oh, really? Uh huh. Uh -huh. So that would be about 340 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's okay. just one thing that popped up when I googled it. Um, Where is it? So 300 wow. years, 350 years, something like that. The next thing that popped up is too much for me to look at while we're doing this, but. Um. You know, Angie. Yeah, go ahead. In verse six. Uh huh. Uh, it just something just struck me. It says, and this is what they began to do. And now God is saying, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Okay, look at my, can you see my observation worksheet and how in pencil I circled that whole line? Because it was so important to me too, like it just stood out. I'm like, this yeah. is key, yeah. Mm -hmm. now, you know, at first when I read that, I thought, so? But as I'm sitting here and thinking, oh, but yeah. that's where God, but that's not where God wanted them and that's not where god wants us i guess mm -hmm. you know that where we can do anything apparent seemingly without oh, him right you know, oh yeah yeah there. we do lots of things without consulting him lots of things i put from commentary i'm sure this was for commentary it's been a long time since i did my observation on this but i put horrific accomplishments of evil men they were unified for an evil purpose um and what this scattering does, when we get to that in just a second, it's really like a check on their power, right? It's like, actually, when left to your own devices, you can do all kinds of things, but I actually am still God. And so when I see that, that this needs to happen, I'll put a check on your power, sort of, if you will. And I'm like, I think that he, well, I know he does that in my life sometimes, too, when I get ahead of him or when I get, you know, I'm at a point in my spiritual walk where 
I I won't say never, but I don't I don't deliberately just leave God out of my life, right? But in my pride or in my apathy or in my um I don't know, self-reliance, I move forward with things, right? Or I devise my own plan or I just think I can take care of this. Uh, I don't need to consult God on that. And most of the time when I do that, it's just this not even deliberate, not like I'm whole, like, I don't, it's not like I feel God saying something to me and I'm like, oh, I'm not listening to you. I don't mean to do that. Um, but yet are, there are times when I certainly get ahead of him or I, or it's my own plan, not his. Right. And from time to time, then he does a little, again, the closer the connection, the quicker the correction, but he does this little like check on my power saying, Angie, um, you, you're not, this isn't something that we're yoked on together, right? This isn't something that we're doing and sort of like in a lesser way, destruction is coming. <laughs> Sin is crouching, right? If you're not, if you're not willing to give that to me and ask me to evaluate the importance of it, uh, then you're not actually being used in the greatest way that I can use you for the way that you want to serve me, the way that I genuinely want to serve him, right? Um, well, yeah. I was thinking about it, um, I think it's, I think we've talked about in this group before where God wants all of, he wants to work so that he's glorified and if and one of the ways that that happens is when impossible things that we could never do on our own that's right take place that's right yep then it's we know it's got to be him yep. it's not us that yep. did it mm -hmm. so it, this is all just kind of gelling in my head yeah but. well the reality is and i probably have said this before too like he people are not attracted to us not really. They're attracted to Jesus in us, right? That's what really. And if and if and if people really are attracted to us, then it's not like a lasting. Um, um, it's fleeting. It's like the fifteen minutes of fame sort of thing that happens to people sometimes, right? That wears. That gets old real quick. Um, so yeah, I think we definitely can accomplish wonderful things. Um, we can accomplish wonderful things that seem like they're right and in line with what Jesus wants for a time at least but if we're really faithful he's going to offer a check on our power too and say you know what I really want you to do is not great things for me what I really want remember what he says in the Old Testament I don't want your worship I don't want your sacrifices I don't want that I want your heart what I really want is an obedient heart that's willing to do what I ask it to do and follow where I lead whether that is on a road to personal greatness or not, right? Because um, I don't evaluate things the same way the world does. Um, and I think it's really interesting. I like Barb's comment a lot, and I appreciate you saying that, Barb, because there is this idea of safety and security, and maybe we wouldn't all think about the fact that we're going out to build a tower that reaches to heaven, but I think we can probably all identify with the things that we're trying to create safety, right? If I, if I do it this way, then I keep myself safe. Yeah. Oh. I read something, and I just wrote it down. I thought it was very appropriate for number six. The forced separation of man from Babel was God's mercy, not his judgment. Think uh, about that. Yeah, say it again. The, the what? The forced separation from Babel uh -huh. was God's mercy, yes. not his judgment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Linguistically and geographically, to put a check on the power of man's body. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually. That's exactly. What we yeah, said. I'm actually going to. What's the What's the word that I um. <laughs> uh, Lisa says everyone's on their game today. The comments are really great. I agree. I think it's it's very rich discussion. Um, there's this idea that actually I'm going to thwart your plan. Okay, uh -huh. hear me out. Yeah. Like God says, I'm actually going to thwart your plan because your plan is never going to get you to the best place. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. I mean, and how many times have I, and I'm going to go way back to, you guys know how much I wanted a career at Disney. We've talked about this before, right? 
and there was this desire in me. I wanted that so bad and I did not understand why that was not allowed to work out in my life. Like that was so, look, I'm, I'm emotional just talking about it. That was so painful to me. I had done everything right. They had wanted me there. It was all set. My tower was being built and safety proofed and everything was right. And he like came into my life and completely like sort of thwarted that plan because the reality is the way that you're building this tower in your life and what you're hoping to get from this for your life is actually a direction that I cannot work in you the way I want to work in you through this plan. And does that mean working at Disney for people is wrong? Does that mean, no, but he said, you're, the, what, the reason that you want this so much is sort of like that tower. You think it's gonna provide you something that I can't provide you for something and what you need to know is I God will provide that for you right no matter what I will provide it for you because there's no tower that you can build on your own that will ever be as secure as learning how to depend on my provision for you um, and so you know I looked at that as a loss for so long and it's taken me a long time to recognize that actually just what you were saying Barb that that was his mercy, not his judgment, not his forgetting me, not his not wanting to bless me with something I desperately wanted, you know. It actually was his mercy saying, I have a better way for you and I want to reveal that to you in your heart. Now, uh, like someone else might have caught on to that faster than 25 years, but I'm slow. <laughs> it takes me a while to get there. <laughs> Um, oh yes, that so good. That's all so good. What what else there before I like jump back into chapter eleven? We're gonna stay in chapter eleven just a little bit longer, um, right? Aren't we? Verse six. Oh gosh, I put six and is that Assyria Babylon? That's the wrong. You guys have to give me a second because now my papers. I have so many papers on this desk now. When I would teach at Murfreesboro, I have this long table and I can spread myself out and keep myself. But I have this little bitty desk now, and I'm like, oh no, I lost my paper. Um, the earth used the same. A, a, found a place in Shinar where the ark landed, used the bricks, and made themselves a name. Here we are. Uh, in Genesis 9, 1, and 7, you don't have to go there because I'm just telling you, this is when God told them to multiply and fill the earth. And again, like we were just saying, they were disobedient to God's command. And then 11.5 kind of has this weird thing that it says, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And, um, which I don't really have anything to add to that. I just think it's kind of weird. Like the Lord came down. It's almost like in 8.1 where it says God remembered Noah. It's not like he came, I mean, I'm confident of this. It's not like he came down because he couldn't tell what they were doing unless he came down. But for some reason, it's like this, um interjection or this observance in a I don't know more tangible way or something and I don't know if anybody I didn't look up any commentary note if anybody has something on 11 5 um, that might be interesting yeah because I it kind of just occurred to me now I'm like oh that's gonna I'm gonna look just real quick anybody have um, and good morning Melanie I see that you have joined us um, 11 11 5 just real quick I'm just gonna look and see if there's anything um, about the Lord came down. If you guys, if there's anything in what you're looking at, the personal character of the language indicates this perhaps was a time when God came down in the form of a man in the person of Jesus Christ. Interesting, that's an enduring word. Uh huh. And then in, it says, let us go down. And again, that us, that's from like Genesis yes. 1, or, 1 or 2, right? That um, created in our image. Remember how, how he's using that plural? We go back to using trinity. that plural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the Trinity. Yeah. Interesting. So the enduring word suggests that it means like actually like maybe came down in the form of a man in the person of Jesus Christ. Interesting. Um, and then, yeah, we, Laura mentioned this already. Nothing they purpose would be to do would be impossible. And this evil was going against his plan. And this was called um, Babel because the Lord confused the language. I'm in verse 9 now, 11.9. And then he dispersed men over the face of the earth. Oh, yeah. Angela, uh huh. I was just, I just found this one thing about then he came down. Um, it says, of course, God could see the Tower of Babel from the moment of its inception. Sure. But for the, but for the writer to mention that he came down to see the city humorously emphasizes 
how far above their tower the Lord was. <laughs> people, oh, that's people, funny. Yeah, the people could never reach the heavens or attain God's yeah. greatness, no matter how high they might Oh, be. that's funny. Yeah, so there's this like, okay, so you're trying to get as high as I am. I'll come yeah. down and show you how that's not possible, sort of yeah. like yeah. yeah. No, yeah. That's yeah. That's that is funny. That's funny. That's cool. Yeah, that is funny. Um, okay, so now let's pause on eleven and go back to ten because that was the piece in eleven that I kind of wanted to pull out and do in that order. And so we're gonna go back into ten, like at thirteen, at the top of page one thirty four, and this is where um, we're still in Ham's descendants. And in verse 13, oh, this was just interesting, 13 and 14, it says, from which came the Philistines. Did you catch that in parentheses right there? I missed that. And, I mean, not, Philistines is just, I, I just thought that was interesting because that's a group of people that we talk about a lot through the Old Testament, right? If those of you who did 1 Samuel, with, like all through 1 Samuel, the enemy was the Philistines, right? The Philistines, Goliath was a Philistine. And so um, those people are going to come up a lot um, throughout the Old Testament as kind of an enemy. And then uh, Canaan was the father of all these. So the 15 through 20, I kind of have a division there. These are um, people of Canaan. And then um, oh, oh yeah, you know what? I looked at, so some of these names, if you look at if you don't want to go there, this is fine. But Joshua, this is not the only place, but I just remembered, so in Joshua, the book of Joshua, there's this verse that I like so much that you might be familiar with. It talks about how here we are in this land and you can worship these gods or these gods, but as for me and my household, you know, that is, um, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And I just remember that before he says that, he lists off these people, and it's in Joshua 24:11. And so he talks about when you cross the Jordan River, now this is after the Exodus, when they're taking the promised land and all that. When you cross the Jordan River, the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Like he's naming off all these groups of people, and these are the same, uh, these are the same names that are in this like 15 to 20, these sons of Canaan, which I just thought was interesting because from these people, it just points to later how in the Bible they're going to be like nations of people that are going to come and then they're actually going to be defeated as they go, as they claim the promised land. Um. Yeah, the, uh, one commentary says that in this section, a notable shift occurs in this section away from place names to the inhabitants themselves. Note the it ending. These are not only the cursed people of Canaan's curse for the scene at Noah's drunkenness, but also they are those who possessed the promised land, which Israel as a nation needed to conquer. Right. Yes. So that is interesting. I didn't pick up on that. So it's basically saying that instead of giving them names, they're giving them almost like um, identities, places. So um, Canaan became the father of Sidon, maybe, and his firstborn in Heth, and the Jebusite and the Amorite and the uh, so he became the father of these people not just this person right one at a time interesting yep I didn't pick up on that yeah uh, those tribes would be able tribes to the yeah mm -hmm. God, yep yeah um and then in verse 21 we go to Shem and Shem is called the father of all the children of Eber his grandson the father of so the father of all the children of Eber and the older brother of Japheth, children were born. Okay, so Shem is the oldest then. So Shem, Japheth, and Ham, I guess, is the, is the age, is the order that it goes. But Eber is actually Shem's grandson. Is that right on the, on the, my notes are saying grandson. If we look on page 92 in the Shem... Looks like maybe even great. Sometimes I get confused on this. That looks like, to me, I'm on page 92 for those of you on Facebook that are um, watching. Shem has a son 
Arpik Sad. You see that one in the middle right there, right? And then Shayla, then Eber. So that would actually almost be son, grandson, great grandson, right? Yeah. Great grandson. Okay. And the reason that's important is because we're getting over here to um, Peleg, because Abram is going to come from that line, Peleg, right? And from Abram, mm -hmm. you know, eventually will be the Messiah. So this is the line that we're going to start following. Um, okay, yeah, so Ar Arpaxid, I don't know how to say that, sorry, the, the one right under Shem, became the father of Shela, became the father of Eber, two sons born to Eber, Eber. Peleg, and Jokthan. And that's in yeah. verse 20 through, 25. And I saw a note in a commentary that said, some commentators say that Eber, Okay, um, so, and the earth is divided in these days, that's in 25. Two sons were born to Eber, the one was Peleg, and Peleg is Abram's, if I did it right, great, great, great grandfather. And in the days of Peleg, I think that's what it's saying, the earth was divided, right? It was divided. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's a little commentary note about time, and these are the kind of things that make my head spin, so hang with me. But Shem has Arpachsid, that's right under the name Shem. After two mm -hmm. years, two years after the flood, this says, and our Arpachshid was 35 when Shayla was born, and Shayla was 30 when Eber was born, and Eber was 34 when Peleg was born, and so Peleg was born 101 years after the flood which is important because then that kind of means the earth was divided 101 years I mean, after the flood. That does not match what we just said about Babel because they were just saying that that was like 340 years after the yeah. flood. Where does this commentary, does the, does the, do the verses say how old people were when they had their children? I don't see yeah. that. It does? They do. Okay. Yeah, they do. Okay. So, okay, yeah, I see that now. What I see it in Tara. On, on, it starts on chapter 11, 12. 11, 12? Yeah, they start, and then they all say how long they... Um, okay, I see that now. Yep. 14 says, and she will live 30 years. Yep, I see that now. Yeah, I was looking and, in 10. That's yeah, why I was... Yeah. I thought that was kind of weird, and then I looked, and they were all like 30, in their 30s, when mm -hmm. they had their first kids. So, I guess my question is, if it's 101 years after the flood that the earth divided, is the earth divided and the Tower of Babel the same? Or, like, according to this commentary, or is it not the same? Don't you wish I had these questions during the week, so I asked questions I had answers to? <laughs> one thing the yes. homework this week just made my head rattle. did it <laughs> yeah. because it really because of all the generations I probably, did, I probably did less of the whole homework this time than i ever have because i just kept going huh <laughs> well i thought I, I, this is going to sound like a criticism or disparaging remark but i guess it actually is i thought <laughs> Katie, the way Kay constructed this lesson it was almost like she was trying to be, not trying to be cagey, but just, you know, it's like, just get to the point. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, what is it you're wanting to glean yeah, us to glean lot, this? A lot of it. Skirting all around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just yeah, didn't it. make sense or didn't seem to go together or didn't have. Uh, Interesting. Now it makes me want to look at the homework a little bit. I, I like that this was a lesson that um, doesn't have a lot of cross-references. And you know me, I live for cross-references. Yeah. And so um, I, I remember kind of getting through it kind of quick, but I do my homework a little bit ahead, and so um, I don't remember. Um, I'm just looking. Well, I think one of the main yeah, things go ahead. That she really was wanting us to, to, she wanted to draw out was that. Oh, in the lifespan. What happens in Chapter 11. Mm-hmm really is occurring mm -hmm. um, in chapter 
10, but you know, which you've already done. Right. That it yeah. Four simultaneously. Yes. Yeah. That it didn't happen after that it happened. I, I'm one of the things that, and this is just a different like style that I have. And you guys know, I, I love studying precept, but you also know that I'm not uh, a big fan sometimes on the, the, what I feel like is the agenda of precept. But, um, I always feel like when we miss, like just what we've been talking about with the tower and the safety, like that's a huge takeaway for me today. How am I building my own tower? How am I finding the mortar that even someone else used to create their safety? And I'm picking that up and I'm bringing it home with me. I'm trying to create my own ark so that the flood doesn't get me, you know, instead of being fruitful and multiplying and trusting in the gifts that God has given me, trusting in the provision. And I'm always a little bit like I feel sometimes like, where's that in this study? Where where are you pointing us to really think about how this is, you can pick this up and apply it in your own life. And I think that's just not the goal for precept, but I'm so grateful for these conversations because sometimes this just brings it together to me. And I'm like, well, that's the point, right? That's the, I mean, it's good to know about the Tower of Babel and it's good to know that they built it in the, you know, I mean, it's good to know that in history. And I think it's fun to try to figure out, you know, how long a time passed and all that. But the growth that God does in my heart is about saying, look at yourself in this, and where's your Tower of Babel, Angie? What are you doing? You know, uh, are you listening when I check your power the way that I checked theirs? Anyway, um, so I, I agree with you on that, definitely. Um, so I have a question about the earth divided and the Tower of Babel and the difference of the time that we that we're looking up and to try to understand if when the when the scripture says. The earth was divided in the time of Peleg. Now, one thing it doesn't say, how do we know how long Peleg lived? Because it doesn't say the earth was divided when the day he was born, either. And still at this time, it's they were living. 209 years after he became the father of Ru, and he was 30 years old when Ru was born. Okay. Does that help at all? <laughs> yes, it, it did if I if I was smart enough. Two hundred and thirty nine years he lived. Two hundred and thirty nine years. So I think it could be possible we were closer. Two hundred and nine. Two hundred and nine years. He was thirty years old. Yeah, when... it says right here. They give you how old they were first when they became the father of, and then they tell you how long he lived. After it said he lived 209 years after he became the father of Ruth. So he was 30 years old. And, and he, he was. And so he was 239. Okay. So. Read 18 and 19. Yeah, I am. Okay. He lived for another 209 years after he became I the father. I just did them all wrong then. I, I thought it included that. You're I'm wrong. So. Currently, I'm lost in the weeds. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, yes. I, I don't know. Um, Between 200 and 239 years old. <laughs> no, I think Barb's right. I just did it wrong. I thought that was included in and he lived. It's it's easy to so I think um, she's right. It's easy to get confused by the yeah. the numbers and the way they're put in there. I agree. Yeah. Cuz sometimes they're almost put in like backwards like this happened then and this yeah. happened that. So Yeah. Um so I think we probably have a little question mark of how long after the flood was the tower of Babel. Um so I I might do a yeah. little bit more looking on that, but since this is our last lesson, I can't tell I can't tell you I'll bring it back next week. Normally I would just say I'll bring it back next week, but um um, because I'm, I'm just, I'm, I don't know for sure if when they mean the earth was divided, if they are equating that to the, um, situation at the Tower of Babel. So, um, and this does, this commentary note from Precept says the earth was divided at least 101 years after the flood. So it doesn't say specifically 101 years. So, okay. So then let's go. So Shem's descendants, if we go back to this map on page 93, Shem is the one that's kind of over towards the right where there's some going up and some going down, spreading east and south. Um, they were spreading out over the earth and I need to go to page 45. Oh yeah. Is there anything about, I don't have anything else on that. Is there anything about like where Shem's 
family went that is interesting or you had questions about or anything like that? Okay, so then let's get back into 11. We're going to finish up 11 from where we were. And um, so, we're, which is kind of like verse 10. We'll pick up back up in 11. Chapter 11, verse 10. Now i got to find my 11. Here it is. These are the generations of Shem, it says. And I thought it was interesting, Precept pointed out this narrowing. So Genesis, we, we've moved, right, from, first of all, we're giving the account or the generations, if you will, of the heavens and the earth. Then we were talking about the generations of Adam. Then we were talking about the generations of Noah. Now we're talking about the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then we're going to narrow in, right, on this these generations and the line from Shem. And in verse 27, it's going to narrow even more to Terah, T E R. A H, which is the father, right, of Abram. Terah is the father. Mm -hmm. We looked on page 91 at a psalm. And so let's go into that. that. There was a psalm kind of at the end of our homework. And I love this psalm. Yeah, that was really cool. I, I read the psalm yeah. through mm -hmm. at least once, if not a couple of times. But yeah. It's put a whole different light on it. I know. And you know what I thought was interesting? Did they mention that Moses wrote this psalm in the study this week? This is the only psalm uh -huh. that Moses wrote. And um, I've studied it before in, in different ways, but I didn't remember that they mentioned that to us this week. And now I can't find my page where my Psalm 91 is. I mean, my Psalm 90, it's on page 91, right? But my 91 is missing. It's probably right here in front of me, and I can't find it. So It's on the back of Noah's descendants. Oh, thank you, and I popped that out. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yep, there it is. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so, so Moses wrote this psalm, and mm -hmm. it talks about, I like verses 9 and 10. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. To, to verse 12 I like so much. So teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. We were doing a Bible study last night, uh, and uh, we were in Colossians 4, 2, talking about devoting ourselves to prayer, and we were looking up the Hebrew word for devote. And it was just talking about this like steadfast, continual connection with God, adherence to God, reliance on God. Um, and, and that's where our strength comes from, right? This deliberate, not passive, but deliberate, active connecting our heart to God's heart. And I think about that when I read verse 12, that we not be apathetic in our relationship with God, but that, that we are continuously strengthening our heart muscle in that we are working to align it with God's heart muscle and teach us to number our days. Like be, be aware that our days are, are numbered, not in this like crazy, you know, paranoid way, but in this like realistic way. Like I am not here forever. And when I meet you, I want to be known as someone that spent my days getting to know you better, gleaning wisdom, not from the world, but from you. So I like that verse 12 so much. Teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. What else did you guys like in, in on page 90, number C at the top of page 90, just kind of has a question. But what, what did you guys get from the psalm? Several of you said you liked it when I, when I mentioned it. What, what about it did you guys find? That's okay. Nothing is fine, or nothing else, nothing in addition. Um, if we go back into finishing up Genesis 11, there's not that much more to talk about, actually. Um, Terah and his sons, Abram, Nahor, and Har Haran, lived in Ur of the Chaldeans, 28. 
And if we were if we were studying on in chapter 12, it's when they'll like move. Uh, and God, like I said, God establishes this covenant with Abram in chapter 12. Um, they le left Ur and traveled to her traveled to Haran, going to the land of Canaan. And Terah has a son, Abram, who has a wife, Sarai. And Haran has a son, um, Lot. And Haran, I don't, I don't think it's in 11. I think it's in 12. The Bible says that Haran dies kind of um, early in life yeah. for one reason or another. Is that in 11 or is it in 12? I don't remember right now. And Lot. In, um... 11. Is it in 11? Okay. And Lot is mm -hmm. Abram's nephew, but you might remember the story that, that Abram like takes care of Lot, kind of. Yeah. Kind of. Lot, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah is a, yeah. yeah, is not the only, yeah. but it is, yeah, kind of a famous story about Lot and Lot's wife and the pillar of salt and all that. that yeah. That's, that's this mm -hmm. Lot. Yeah. So. Okay, so those are that's actually the end of my notes for today, which I think points to what Joyce Wisely was saying earlier, that I don't I don't know how much like it seemed like there was a little bit less meat to this lesson than there than there are to some of them. So I would I would say I, I agree with that for sure. But thinking about we can spend a little bit more time on the timeline if you guys want to try to uh, figure that out a little bit, untangle that, or verse twenty. Oh, Donalyn says verse twenty. Oh, thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, if you want to try to untangle that a little bit more, or did you have other thoughts or questions from this lesson? Or is there anything I, else as a whole from Genesis that you guys want to talk about? Somebody was going to talk. I, uh, I yeah. have a question. Good. On page 88. Yes. E. They're talking about um, how thing, the languages change. Um, let me see. Uh-huh. Genesis 11 to the Genesis 11 4 compare it. I'm on I'm on the 87 e I didn't understand I have a question mark next to it I didn't know how to answer that where are you again Mary Ellen 80 page 88 at the uh, at the top there's a C D and E oh and, okay. and it relates to it says to go and look at Daniel 4 Mm -hmm. And man, I didn't get anything out of that at all. So I, I'm going to read Daniel 12, 4. Um, this is from the New Living. It says, But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end, when many will rush here and there, and knowledge will increase. So I think partly because I know Kay's flavor, precepts flavor, and also from reading this Daniel 12, 4, I think there's always this little, are you aware that the end times are coming? Are you aware that the end times are coming? So I think what she's pointing to is think about how easily we can communicate with different people in different places and different languages today. And think about what Daniel is being said, that the Lord is telling Daniel here. At the end, at the end time, the time of the end, many will rush here and there and knowledge will increase. So I think what she's saying is, what she's trying to say is think about how easily we communicate, how easily we travel, how easily we get our message from one place to another, how much smaller the world has become, right? And how that points to people rushing here and there and knowledge increasing. As opposed to when language would have first been scattered and if you didn't speak that language, you just didn't communicate with those people, right? That's well, does that mean we have, we have the, the knowledge now to, um, to communicate to others and so I think uh, about, about Jesus is that I mean are we are we doing that or no I think no? I think she's saying the end times are near because we rush near. here because we rush here and there and knowledge will increase and knowledge is increasing oh and and I, okay. I, I say that with a little bit um, <laughs> Donna Lynn says but we can speak the same language and not understand each other so true, <laughs> true. so true <laughs> yes um, but I think you know, I think they're always pointing us to the end times. And I think, and here's what I, I think we need to be actively waiting. We need to not be in denial. Jesus is coming again. Like, I, we, I believe that. He is coming again, and that is real. And we need to be actively waiting for his return and preparing ourselves. Like, 90-12, teach us to number our days so that we can show you a heart of wisdom. I didn't quote that exactly right. But we need to be actively waiting. But at every point in history, 
our knowledge has increased, right? And so, I mean, at any point you can say, well, this is the end time because our knowledge has increased so much. Well, true. But if, you know, when my great grandchildren, assumingly, right, are looking back maybe into the time when I lived and how we handled this pandemic and all kinds of things, they'll, they'll look and say, wow, we know so much more than they did then about how to do this, right? So I, I, so I think that that's, I, I just think that's a little bit dramatic uh, in that we really just always need to, the Lord says, you know, just stay prepared because you don't know when the Lord is coming. And anybody that tries to say, oh, you can see the signs or whatever, I'm like, oh no, I think it's very clear in the Bible that he's not going to let us know when he's coming. Um, and our job is to stay actively aware. So I think that, that's what I think, Mary Ellen, that it's kind of a point to see how the end, yeah. and is it closer to when Jesus is coming? Absolutely, right? It's always closer yeah. to when Jesus it's is coming. Closer. Right, yeah. But I also don't think I need that we need to be, like, afraid of it or, you know, one. But I, I think that's what it, that, anybody else? Yeah, on that? Laura, go ahead. I, yeah. She's, she put that in the context of that verse that, that talks about how nothing they purpose to do will be impossible for them. And I, just the phrase too big for our britches popped mm. into my head, you know, yeah. and yes. we all, I mean, probably every generation thinks, oh, we, we're so much smarter than yes. the previous generation. Yeah. We know so much more. Um, where was I headed with that? I don't know. Yeah. Just that we want yeah. To know, well, we so are. I think we're. We think we, we are so smart and yeah. intelligent. Yeah. And who needs God because right. you know, we've we got this God. right yeah in big and small ways I like, would and it, you know that's our own tower of Babel then right as a society we, we construct them individually and we construct them as a society as well absolutely my dad's reading this book or listening to it on audio I think it's the um I'm gonna get it wrong maybe like the Spanish flu of 1812 that was a huge pandemic that, that you, I'm not sure that I have that right but um, uh, and um, he just talks about how you know it's so interesting as he's listening to it about really they did the same things that we're doing like it's not you know real we're even doing. all that time ago now and he what he's listening to is that it um, it it killed people much more and so there was more fear and things but he, but he's just saying basically we're using the same tactics um, and, and we, do we have different ways of communicating and do we have different ways of, of course we do, you know, we have different medical knowledge and all those kind of things. But he's like, basically, we're still doing the same things that we did when we were battling that pandemic, you know. So we are smarter and we're not. I mean, you know, at the same time too, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So other things if from this lesson or the study as a whole. All right, well, let's pray, and I'll try to be uh, uh, cognizant of the time and all that. So, God, thank you so much. As we close down this lesson, it's been nice to do so just with some conversation about what's next and be able to just kind of share our hearts about what we're learning from the studies. And I'm so grateful that you have brought this way to study in my life and what it's taught me about how to slow down and really learn from your word, Lord. Um, I just feel like we're, we're getting such a solid foundation in understanding your story and because we can better understand your story, Lord, we can see ourselves in your story and we can really find um, how you want to grow us individually, Lord. And so I just appreciate that and I appreciate this group that you have blessed me with in order to study. And uh, it provides accountability, Lord, and I need that. But it also, Lord, provides fellowship and companionship and um it's, it makes me want to be better, Lord. And so I just appreciate the blessing that this is in my life. And I ask that over the weeks that come, that you just continue to remind me of the seeds that you want me to, just really those that those truth nuggets that you would have me just really hang on to, Lord, as I think back about this study from this summer, Lord, spring and summer. And so I just lift that up and I lift up our time on break, Lord, and pray that we continue to find other ways to connect with you. Um, and then be able to, after a few weeks, come back and, and get into a new study, Lord. So, again, we just, we love you and we're grateful. And we just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I so will. So, Angie, next week is um, 9.30, you said? Yeah, let's do 9.30, yeah. just a little bit later. Yeah. We don't need an hour and a half, I don't think. And so, yeah, yeah let's do 9.30 around and I'll be here and I will yeah. uh, have some bagels or something for you. And so we can yeah. have a little snack and get some books and whatever else we want to do just kind of catch up and actually i think it'll be just really good to be together so and if i remember i've i've actually got some um, 
tampons and things like oh, that. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Bring there. anything yeah, like that if you want. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome if you yeah. do. Yeah. I'm, if you... just, I'm thinking food, and then all of a sudden yeah. she it's pulls tampons. Out, hey, it's tampons. It's tampons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Be like, bring your tampons and let's come have fun. So, <laughs> anybody here needs them. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say goodbye to my Facebook group. <laughs>